Death Magnetic had everything to become the ultimate Metallica album, but it fell short. Hi friends, it's Andriy Vosilenko and welcome to Metallic Geek. Death Magnetic. Death Magnetic. It was the album that everyone had been waiting for 20 years. The Metallica's back. The sound they abandoned in their mid-twenties now returned as the boys started getting wrinkles, bellies and, and gray hair. Or losing hair. <coughs> in the late 80s, nobody else played so fast and brutal while remaining so tight and balanced. Metallica expanded the metal horizon to each new album, clearing the way and taking the shots for the bands coming after. They were like a fucking bulldozer! And then just cut it. Whether for creative fatigue, for playing trash or for seeing its decline. I mean the Black Album was an array of reasons why Metallica simplified and went a bit more mainstream. And so anyway, as the 90s came, Metallica started their period of wandering. And to some, the period hasn't ended still. But most would agree, they had reclaimed the rust on Death Magnetic in 2008. The album was basically a combination of all the Golden Age records. Standard tuning is back, solid riffs, Kirk's solos are back, and James is solely in charge of rhythm again. They got the balls to write another instrumental again. And even bigger balls for making another Unforgiven. And, what is most importantly to me, the riff gates were open. Mind you, Sentanger 2 was pretty riffy, but now it's finally the good old type j -j 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 -j, which is best for E standard. And so basically, Death Magnetic had everything to become the ultimate Metallica album. But it fell short. It lacked some 5 or 10% to go in one line with Master and Justice. So, what did go wrong? And no, I'm not talking about the messed up production. That shouldn't be much a surprise after Sentinger. Yes, Magnetic is too overcompressed. The levels are the point of clipping. Like my videos. It was a casualty of the so-called loudness war, when artists made their songs more loud than their competitors, so they, they stood out, you know. What a bullshit. But the price was ruining all the freaking dynamics. And on top of that, Death Magnetic had rather questionable drums. Speech correction, As we gather. suppressed bass, the latter could be just another old tradition brought back. Yeah, the riffing was tight and magnetic, which cannot be said about the composition. The entire album could have been boiled down by at least 5%, maybe even 20%, and not losing from it, but actually gaining, um, again, listenability. Metallica always tends to be zero waste. Their infamous riff bank is always full. And it's hard to leave stuff out. Plus, every riff goes through variationizing. And they want to keep every variation in. There we have a Frankenstein episodic, uh, like uh, the end of the line. In other regards, the album is brilliant. I loved it when it came out. It was the freshest album when I, at my time when I just became Metallica fan. And it's actually aging like a fine wine. I wish they could play the songs more often. <laughs> But again, it comes down that it's almost like justice stuff. It's pretty exhausting to play live. But the most important thing is that the guys sort of came to their senses and reinvented themselves on Magnetic by returning to the roots. And it might have not happened if one dude was not around. It's Rick Rubin. Yeah, he was not following Metallica at every step of album making, like Bob Rock was. But Rick's contribution was kind of different kind and quite meta. He once came and said, Guys, why don't you play the old stuff? I mean, like, Master of Puppets and Justice kind of stuff. Turns out, Metallica did not even consider that after St. Anger. They were kind of scared. They thought it's not possible. Like, probably they are too old and shit. Rick made us comfortable uh, about revisiting and, and being maybe um, inspired by some of the records we put out in the 80s. He knew what the ultimate Metallica album should sound like in his head. Don't be afraid of that. And just look at the demos they played in 2006. It's nothing like Death Magnetic, even though it contains some riffs that wouldn't up at it. So even in 2006, Metallica were still in the grips of St. Anger. Demo Magnetic sounds like a transition. I wake up screaming, life is 
while Metallica were in the process of reconnecting to their young old selves. As well as Beyond Magnetic EP, which were leftover songs. They were kind of the missed link from St. Anger Magnetic. And plus, in 2006, Metallica played Master of Puppets entirely for its 20th anniversary. <laughs> And they admit it helped them get the fire back. The young boys were still inside. We kind of got in under the skin of Master Puppets there for a while. And right as we kind of started writing these new songs, it made us feel comfortable about uh, embracing some of the things that we had done in the 80s for the first time really in, in 15, 17 years. And Rick Rubin was like the final drop. Fuck it, let's go fucking jam and do like the fucking old stuff. And suddenly they had remembered how to write the stuff that actually made the Metallica. Though this time without tons of alcohol. So Rick was very clever, even in the tuning of the songs. Like, you know, why does Metallica have everything tuned down a half step? So we ended up trying the songs in uh, natural tuning. Rick actually suggested that. Right, the transition from St. Anger to Magnetic, it was a pretty unknown period of Metallica life. And I had written an article about it, which might turn into video or not. Link. In description, so check it out on our blog. Now let's dissect the album that revived Metallica track by track. All right, guys, so here's the deal. I planned this video to be like 20 minutes with the, all the songs in this video, but it turns out too overwhelming to me to edit. So yeah, here's the deal. The rest of the video, the breakdown of the songs goes as a podcast. Go to metallicgeek.com slash 36, or if you are subscribed to Metallic Geek on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, you already got it in your downloads. Follow Metallic Geek for more podcasts there, because that's kind of the future of this show. More of a audio than video, because we are listening to fucking music. And kind of compensate for it, uh, here's a KTI film today. <laughs> Alright guys, I got something for you. You might have noticed this. It's actually going for a cover, for a really epic cover of Black Album. I was blessed to be part of it. Let me show you. It's my wife painted it. So yeah, I'm not sure if it's for sale, but just, just look at it. It's the texture, oh my... Uh. Go to my wife's Instagram and check out the paintings. And maybe if you like one, Ask her if it's for sale. And if you don't care about the paintings, but you do care about Metallica, Metallica Geek Podcast is for you. This is the stuff that does not go as videos, but it's kinda underground club. For free, no ads, no paid memberships. It's just it's just for my best friends. Thanks for watching, it's Andrew Vasilenko and be in metal.